Senator Kennedy was first elected a senator in 1962. It was my freshman year at MIT, and I can still remember the campaign, uh, uh, as the senator does, I'm sure. <laughs> Since then, it's really been some magnificent history. He has played a leading role in health care, education, and many other important social issues facing our nation. He has represented Massachusetts in the United States Senate since 1962 and has become the most, perhaps most influential advocate in the nation for quality health care and for educational opportunity. He chairs the Senate Health Education Labor and Pensions Committee, also serves on the Judiciary Committee and the Armed Services Committee. He's a member of the Congressional Joint Economic Committee and a trustee of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington. In a very appropriate tribute to Senator Kennedy that will be coming up soon, he will receive an award from previous uh, former President George Bush, the 2003 George Bush Award for Excellence in Public Service. The award, as I say, will be November 7, and when the Bush Foundation announced the award, they noted that during Senator Kennedy's remarkable career spanning over four decades, he has consistently and courageously fought for his principles and has rightly earned the respect of his Senate colleagues on both sides of the aisle. His career is indeed filled with examples of that bipartisanship. In 1985, Senator Kennedy worked with Senator Dole and others to create, within the Strategic Defense Initiative, the Star Wars Initiative, a special program to promote lasers for medical applications. And here at UC Irvine, we've done as much as anybody to not only take advantage of that program, but to deliver science to, to people who need new techniques for diagnosis and treatment. It was called the Medical Free Electron Laser Program, and it was the first such program to provide federal funding for research in the use of lasers in medicine. UC Irvine is one of five centers in the country that's consistently received funding from that program. It's made a major impact on our research, on the patients that our medical uh, school services, as well as a number of companies who have taken advantage of developments. In higher education, Senator Kennedy has helped students and their families to keep up with the ever-growing costs of college education. In fact, he was the leader in promoting an amendment to increase student financial aid through an increase in the Pell Grants, just one of many measures that, that we can mention that exemplify his support to higher education. On behalf of the entire UC Irvine community, I'm honored and pleased to present the 2003 Peldison Lecturer, Senator Edward M. Kennedy, Senior Senator from Massachusetts. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much to Chancellor Cicerone. I want to thank you very much for your kind and uh, generous uh, introduction. Uh, to Jack Peldison, the uh, very distinguished uh, educator that is, uh, we honor with these uh, lectures. And I just wanted him to know that the government of the people is required reading in Massachusetts, uh, as well as I'm, I'm sure perhaps out here as well. Uh, Professor Dalton, Mayor Agron, I'm uh, glad that he was here this evening. We met him earlier tonight. He is someone that has been so uh, strongly committed in terms of child care and affordable housing and uh, open spaces. He uh, p received part of his education in Massachusetts as well. Uh, so we, uh, we like to claim uh, credit whenever we can. America is at its best and has always been a nation of great promise and unlimited possibility. Generations of Americans have shared this optimism even as they have waged their own struggle for social justice and equal rights and greater opportunity here at home and for a role in the world that reflects these basic values and respects other people in other lands. Over our history, we have learned that no government can afford to lose sight of the fundamental truth that the struggle for social justice and for a better life and a better world is never done. As Robert Kennedy told the students, at the University of Cape Town in South Africa in 1966. Each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lots of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, these ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. In our own day and generation, 
We have seen walls of oppression and resistance crumble in our own land and in many other nations. To no small extent, we are able to talk today about the family of nations because of all we have done to bring free nations together for the greater good of all peoples everywhere. We have not always done that wisely or well, and we now seem to be on a dubious course in the world that leaves much to be desired. The end of the Cold War a decade ago gave us unrivaled power in the world, but that very power is also the root cause of our current difficulty because we have not yet learned to use it wisely and well. The great danger, as Lord Acton warned a century ago, is that power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And the dilemma that we face now in Iraq frames the problem. We won the war as we knew we would. But the way we won by waging it alone without the support of the world community has made it far more difficult to win the peace. As we all know, the situation there remains extremely serious. We continue to lose more and more troops almost daily. We have lost far more soldiers since the President flew out to the aircraft carrier on May 1st and declared mission accomplished than during the few weeks of the major combat. The mission is far from accomplished. Terrorists are sabotaging the reconstruction effort, lashing out in every way they can. U.S. casualties are on the rise. The forces arrayed against us are increasing the intensity and sophistication of their assaults, and at the same time, the Iraqi population is becoming more and more restless. We should never, I believe, have gone to war in Iraq when we did, in the way we did, and for the false reasons we were given. As a result of our diplomatic failure, other nations refuse to join us, and our troops are being asked to serve longer tours of duty under grueling conditions. More and more reservists, who now make up almost 50% of our presence in the region, are being called up with no end in sight. 85% of all the coalition troops on the ground are Americans, and we're taking 85% of the casualties, and $87 billion isn't going to change that. It is time for the administration to admit that it was wrong and to turn in a new direction. We need a genuine plan that acknowledges the realities on the ground and offers a realistic prospect of creating a free and peaceful Iraq and bringing our troops home with honor. It is essential to involve the international community as an active and equal partner in the political transition of Iraq. We need to give the United Nations a central role. The administration's decision to go back to the United Nations a week ago was a first step, but it'll be meaningful only if the administration is genuinely changing its policy. The real test will be whether the administration is now willing to make the compromises necessary to persuade other countries to contribute troops to relieve our soldiers and bring stability to Iraq. The jury is still out on whether the security resolution marks a real shift by the administration. We need to give greater priority to sharing power with the Iraqi people and the United Nations during the reconstruction and help lay the groundwork for approving a constitution and holding national elections. In Afghanistan, we obtained the support of the international community for an interim government. There was no American occupation. That process can still work in Iraq, although it would have clearly worked better from the start. We know from the experience in the past decade in Bosnia, in Kosovo, in other devastated lands, in East Timor, that we can enlist the international community in a major way. We can share responsibility and authority, draw on the strength and diversity of the United Nations, achieve security and reconstruction, and an end to the occupation. It makes no sense to try to bypass the United Nations by enticing a few receptive nations to join us if the price is right. No one doubts that the United States should remain in charge of the military operation. But internationalizing the reconstruction is not a luxury. It is an imperative. Sharing authority with the United Nations to manage the transition to democracy will give the process the legitimately, legitimacy it so urgently needs and gradually dispel the current stigma of occupation. 
especially if it's accompanied by the creation of a more fully representative interim governing council to deal with day-to-day -day administrative responsibilities. We need to actively engage the Iraqi people in governing and rebuilding their country. The administration is wrongly working from the top down, rather from the bottom up to rebuild Iraq. A new Iraq will emerge neighborhood by neighborhood, town by town, province by province. Our soldiers now risking their lives in Iraq deserve no less. And how can any Republican president of the United States disagree that government must be of the people, by the people, and for the people? Here at home, we face serious challenges as well. When our troops in Iraq return, we want them to come home to jobs and opportunity, to better schools for their children, and decent health care for their families. Instead, our troops are coming home to a stagnant economy. More than three million jobs have been lost because of the recent recession. The greatest number since the Great Depression, the unemployment, is nationally over 6%. In the past three years, the well-being of American families has been declining at an alarming rate. Ask most Americans how their lives have changed in those years, and they will tell you. Declining job security, disappearing retirement savings, plummeting school budgets, soaring tuition for college, skyrocketing health care costs and prescription costs, massive federal budget deficits threatening the future of Social Security and Medicare, and massive deficit, deficits facing California and virtually every other state. The administration points to the reconstruction projects being undertaken in Iraq, schools refurbished, roads repaired, communities rebuilt, $87 billion worth in the coming year, while here at home we shortchange priorities in education, health care, in the name of shared sacrifice. But the sacrifice isn't being shared. A handful of wealthy Americans are enjoying billion dollar tax breaks, while most Americans are getting the cold shoulder. Make no mistake about it, the funds now being spent in Iraq are having an effect on the well-being of the millions of Americans. A week ago in the United States Senate, when we were debating the $87 billion, there was a simple amendment offered by Joe Biden and my colleague John Kerry about the top 1% of the reduction in the tax program over the period of the next seven years. Over the next seven years, the reduction in the Bush tax cut will uh, inure $680 billion to those whose in income is $1 million a year or more. $680 billion. This amendment said, let's just reduce it to $600 billion instead of $680 billion. And that amendment uh, lost. The request for $87 billion is an enormous sum. It is more than the combined budget deficits of all 50 states in 2004. It's 87 times what the federal government spends annually on after-school programs. After-school programs that were meant to try and provide the additional kinds of services for children afterwards that are being challenged in their uh, schools. I pay tribute to the work that's done in this community in terms of its public schools and the excellence of it, the rise in the SATs, 90% of your high school graduates go on uh, to college. It's an enormous success story that you have here in this community. It's a tribute to your local leadership. But after school programs uh, make such an extraordinary difference to children that are being challenged in the schools to get the supplementary help and assistance and also be able to, uh, to find uh, ways in terms of uh, future potential employment, as well as being involved in sports. $87 billion is two years' worth of the unemployment benefits. It's seven times what President Bush proposed to spend on education for low-income schools in 2004. It's nine times what the federal government spends on special education each year, in spite of the fact of the remarkable success where Fifteen years ago, we had four million children that were never, four and a half million children never even going to school, special needs children, kept in closets, away from the public schools. And now the number of special needs children that are going on into colleges and universities and completing and, and achieving independent living and uh, productive lives. 
It's eight times what the government spends to help middle and low income students go to college. I offer the amendment to raise, as we have seen with the tuition increases, 19% here in Irvine, to raise the Pell Grants uh, for, uh, to increase that by $500 on that. And now this is, we got 4.2 million children, the average income of which is $15,000 a year. And these children are able to make it in terms of being academically challenged into the schools. But you have the rise in the in increase in the tuition and the failure of the states as they're cutting back in their programs. The numbers of children that we're gonna lose without the increase in the Pell Grants are in the hundreds of thousands. And the two and a half million, billion dollars that I offered to increase that to four, $4,500, we lost that in there and $87 billion. I don't think it's a replacement. I don't think it's a replacement. I never offered the take that money out of, of what we are going to need in terms of the troops, but it is a reflection of national priorities. It is a reflection of national uh, priorities. It is 15 times what the government spends on cancer research. It's 27 times what the government spends on substance abuse and mental health. And it's 58 times what the government spends on community health centers, which are the backbone in many of our communities, particularly for those who haven't got the health insurance. The choices we make on our economy speak clearly about our values, especially our commitment to social justice and equal rights. We are learning the hard way that prosperity cannot be sustained in our nation over the long term unless it's accompanied by greater social justice. The president signed the No Child Left Behind education reforms into law great fanfare last year, and Congressman George Miller of California was the principal leader in achieving that breakthrough, and its important reforms are clearly needed to improve the nation's schools. The fundamental principle in the No Child Left Behind are the right reforms for our schools, and we know these reforms work because their effectiveness has been proved again and again in a variety of schools across the nation. Massachusetts effectively adopted these uh, probably eight years ago. And now we are number one in the country for fourth graders, number one in eighth graders. And we are the state that has reduced the disparity in terms of race more than any other state because of the investments which are absolutely identical with the No Child Left Behind. The record's out there. We have seen this demonstrated. We know all students are capable of greater achievement when standards are raised. This summer we heard it again. SATs are rising because more young people are now taking challenges coursing at younger age. We know that high quality assessments can diagnose the learning needs of students and provide the foundation for specific reforms and greater school improvement. Tests alone are not the answer, but they clearly show the way. We know that a fair way to hold schools accountable can lead to higher performance for all students and help close the achievement gap. That's what we're doing in Massachusetts, and there's no question that it's working. We know that reforms such as better teacher training, smaller class size in underperforming schools will lead to greater student achievement. We've seen that happen in North Carolina, in Tennessee, and elsewhere across this country. But most of all, we know that it takes additional resources to achieve any of these successes. And the need is greatest in the poorest communities that serve the neediest children. And that was the decision that we made as a nation, Republicans and Democrats alike, in the early 1960s, that we were going to say that the neediest children in this country that were falling behind were a matter of national concern, not just state concern, of national concern. And that is what we had thought with the No Child Left Behind was going to be all about. But this year, the administration proposed to cut uh, for these reforms by 1.2 billion. It'll need their nearly six million needy children, leave a half a million students out of after-school programs that keep them off the streets and out of trouble. It proposes no additional funding for teacher training, no additional funds for smaller class sizes, no additional funds for Head Start, even though 650,000 needy young children are on the Head Start waiting list. College is often out of reach as well. For too long, the doors of higher education have been closed to too many qualified students because they cannot afford the cost. This year and next, double-digit tuition increases, tight education budgets in the state make it harder to realize the hope of a college education. Here at Irvine, I understand the t tuition increase in 19% this year. Just as Social Security is a promise to every senior citizen, 
So we should make education security a promise to every young American. If you work hard and you finish your high school, if you work hard and finish your high school, if you're admitted to a college, we should guarantee that you can afford the cost of four years it takes to earn a degree. Surely we have reached a stage in America where we can say it and mean it. Cost should never again be a disqualification for college. Fulfilling these requirements <clears throat> will require a new resolve by everyone involved, by families, colleges, states, and the federal government. Families should pay what they can afford. Colleges should commit to keeping tuition increases down. States should continue as much support as they can for students in hard economic times, and federal support should make up the gap that remains. In these modern times, we must recognize that learning is a lifetime enterprise, and education is the golden door for all, and we cannot allow it to stay closed for any in our society. Our health care as well, the crisis continues to fester. The 43 million Americans without health insurance, the millions of senior citizens waiting for relief from skyrocketing prescription drug uh, deserve better. We all know it. Minority health disparities continue to fester, yet we refuse to give needed priority to training more minority professionals. Few domestic needs are more pressing than to assure affordable health care for the American people. In this modern age of breakthrough medical miracles, it is a national disgrace that for so many Americans, the quality of their health care is measured by the quantity of their wealth. The cost of our neglect is staggering in terms of human suffering, the loss of creative abilities, and avoidable expenses for Medicare, medical care, and long-term care. Two and a half million more Americans are without health insurance today than they were two years ago. One in 10 small businesses that offered their employees health insurance three years ago no longer do today. We know the devastating effect of the lack of insurance on health outcomes. The uninsured are fewer, uh, use fewer preventive and screening services and have higher rates of mortality and disability than those with insurance. Beyond the obvious health effects, this lack of coverage leads to fewer working days and lower earnings. Uninsured children have poor school attendance, low achievement, and less development. And the average cost of health insurance is rising at double-digit rates, 11% in 2001, 13% in 2002, 14% so far in 2003. The health care squeeze on working family is getting tighter and tighter. Hopefully, California's recent action is a sign of new progress. Under the new California Health Insurance Act, large and medium-sized businesses must pay into a fund to provide health coverage for their workers or pay 80% of the premium costs. Its goal is to establish the basic principles that every job should provide not only the ability to earn a living, but also to meet the health needs of your family. It holds employers accountable for meeting the health needs of their workers, but gives them the flexibility in how they want to meet them. It's an excellent start to providing coverage for every Californian, and I hope that we can expand it to all Americans. We can cut rising costs as well by improving healthcare technology. Healthcare is one of the least efficient industries in America. Administrative costs uh, consume more than 40 cents of every health dollar. Listen to this. We spend a trillion 500 billion in the every, uh, every year on healthcare. That is $5,000 for every man, woman, and child. We're double virtually any other industrial nation in the world in terms of healthcare. 40 cents of every dollar is non-clinical, non-clinical. You reduce that to 35%, uh, percent, you save $50 billion, $60 billion a year. You reduce it to 30%, and it's $150 billion a year. You can provide all the prescription drugs, you can provide nursing home care, you can provide all of the children and cover the, uh, the uninsured. Health insurance, health care, and defense are the two industries in this nation that don't use the information technology the way that they should. 
You enter the Mass General Hospital, it's $25 per transaction. It was that way for Fidelity 15 years ago. Now they are three cents and going to a third of a cent. And in Mass, Mass General, as most of our teaching hospitals are going up. And there are ways of dealing with this issue. And uh, we have to deal with this uh, issue uh, in terms of the cost and the escalation as well as coverage. We need to invest in better preventive care and do more to see that the best standard of care. Diabetes afflicts one in five Americans and one out of four Medicare dollars is spent in diabetes. But less than 2% of the adults with diabetes receive proper level of care. By using proven prevention and treatment, we could save more than $50 billion a year and save 10 million Americans from diabetes-related amputations, disability, and blindness. Another example is stroke, third leading cause of death. We spend $30 billion annually just to care for stroke victims. But with prompt treatment, we can prevent disabilities caused by stroke. Currently, only 3% of stroke patients receive the prompt and proper care. Discoveries in the life science may well shape this new century as profoundly as discovered in physics, engineering, shape the last one. I believe it deeply. I believe this is the century for the life sciences. Soon damaged kidneys may not require years of dialysis. A scarred cornea may not mean blindness. A crushed spine may not lead into a lifetime in a wheelchair. Malfunctioning cells that cause diabetes, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, may be replaced with healthy ones. Nearly half of all the persons in nursing homes in the United States suffer from Alzheimer's or other dementia. You have the breakthrough in terms of Alzheimer's. You're going to empty, in my state, two-thirds of all the nursing homes on this. Investing in a cure for Alzheimer's would clear out many of our nursing homes, bringing fuller lives to millions and saving billions of dollars. The benefits can be immense in bringing fuller lives to millions of our fellow citizens and saving billions of dollars. We have so many pressing priorities, and with the right cho uh, choices, they're within our grasp. We've made so much progress already that not only can we dream of a universal health coverage, we can get there. Not only can we dream of full employment, where everyone who wants a job can find a job, we can make it happen. We did it successfully in the late 90s, and we did it in the early 60s. Not only can we dream of a day when every child gets education they deserve from birth, we can make it a reality if we continue to invest in our schools, our teachers, the real heroes and heroines of the 21st century. Now more than ever, we need a common purpose to unite us to achieve our goals at home and abroad. If we harness the spirit of American optimism, we can meet our goals and reflect our great values of justice and equality of opportunity in this new time. Thank you all again for the great honor, and thank you for all you do so well for the young men and women of this great state. Good.